All right, buenos dias, mis amigos. All right, so I got a request here from Pressing On Media, and uh, he's got a long message here, so I'll spare you from reading it all, but um, basically I'm going to make this for him or her and try to keep it real simple. So first of all, let me start off by showing what's wrong in the message and in, in his uh, in his comment here so we're gonna start off by um, showing the the spirit of error and the spirit of truth so we're gonna start by showing the the error and then I'm gonna show you the truth so the error in this comment is um, first of all there is no tribulation okay you talk about uh, a tribulation, you know, uh, like a seven-year tribulation. There is no seven-year tribulation. Right now, we are in tribulation. Okay, in the world, you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. In the world, you shall have tribulation, tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So we're going through tribulation right now, every day. The tribulation that we go through gets worse and worse and worse that if God allowed things to play out as they are there would come a point to where there would be nobody saved and it's, that's essentially what Jesus is referring to in Matthew 24 Mark 13 and Luke 21 the tribulation that we go through gets worse and worse and worse and except those days be shortened there should be no flesh saved but for the elect's sake those days shall be shortened now immediately after the tribulation is when the Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven and it's the end of the world remember in Matthew 24 Mark 13 Luke 21 Jesus is asked specifically what is the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world and the end of the world is when he comes in the clouds of heaven all right, so there is no seven-year tribulation. We're going through tribulation now. And there's just simply no seven-year tribulation mentioned anywhere at all in the Bible. Okay, people are just lying, straight up lying about it. And they couldn't show it to you if their life depended on it because it simply does not exist. All right, and then if you want to go to uh, Daniel 9, it, Daniel 9 does not mention a seven-year tribulation at all. Not, not at all. All right, he does talk about 70 weeks. All right, and you read the whole chapter and understand the context. Uh, he's pondering 70 years, and then the angel corrects him and says 70 weeks, and in the midst of the weeks, uh, the midst of the, the last week is when Jesus lays down his life. Okay. So this is when Jesus uh, was killed and then rose from the dead. And now we're waiting for the consummation, which is when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. All right. Um, I want to encourage you to be familiar with that and to understand, know and to understand that this vision is concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not about the Antichrist at all. The Antichrist is not the Messiah. He is not the one that caused the sacrifice to cease. Jesus presented himself as the perfect sacrifice for sins. And he's the one that makes reconciliation for iniquity. And he's the one that brings in everlasting righteousness. This has nothing at all to do with any Antichrist. And then, of course, the other aspect here in your the other part I should say in your comment is this idea that the Antichrist is going to come the Antichrist is already here all right and we can go to uh, real quickly if I can if this is possible we go to Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Second Thessalonians 
chapter 2 is a reference to the Antichrist. The, now, there's a lot. I don't want to go over everything. But just, I'm going to give you one example here. All right. And so, we can compare that with what we read in the book of Daniel. And this is a parallel in the book of Daniel. <clears throat> in Daniel chapter 11, verse 37, Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. In Daniel chapter 11, this is in reference to the fourth beast, Daniel prophesies, taught, he taught four beasts, and then the end of the world. And the fifth kingdom is the everlasting kingdom. So Daniel names these four beasts, which are four kings in their kingdoms. And the first kingdom is the Babylonian Empire, the second is the Medes and the Persians, and the third one is the Greek Empire. And we can conclude definitively that the fourth empire is the Roman Empire. Uh, simply by going to the in the beginning of the New Testament, Luke chapter 2, for example, verse 1, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. So by this verse we know that the Romans were in power. And therefore we know that the Romans are the fourth empire of Daniel. And therefore we know when we read about this, um, who opposed, this guy that opposes this king, that opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God. We know that this is the fourth king kingdom. All right, and this parallels Second Thessalonians chapter two, and therefore we know that this kingdom is in place right now. All right, there's no pause or skip or dead period or whatever. It goes from one kingdom to the next. One, two, three, four, and then it's over. And the fifth kingdom, or the last kingdom, is the everlasting kingdom, which uh, happens at the end of the world. Okay. All right. Forgive me if I go too long on this. All right, so you want to know about <clears throat> a condensed version of, um, you know, uh, how do I explain? Okay, there's one more thing here. You, you talk about um, Megiddo. I hope I'm saying that right. Megiddo? 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 Uh, I'm not sure I'm saying that right now. Sounding funny coming out of my mouth. But regardless, I know there's that movie. I've never seen the movie, but the movie... It, you don't trust the movie. The movie's not the Word of God. And... Um, we read in like uh, Judges 5 for example we read uh, about uh, Megiddo Megiddo it's sounding funny coming out of my mouth I don't think I'm saying it right but um, essentially uh, this is a battle that's already taken place okay and then we read in Revelation 16 um, he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon Armageddon they say is a Hebrew word that means on the hill of Megiddo okay um, this is all just symbology for the end of the world and for the judgment of God and the great day of the Lord this teaching is is echoed all throughout the Bible from Genesis to Revelation um, it's not contrary to anything else that we read about and that we learn all throughout the Bible, okay? And so, you, if you consider this, uh, I've heard this people say this is a, re, they refer to this place as a place of mourning, right? For example, Zechariah 12, in that day shall there be a great mourning, all right? There was a great mourning in that battle that took place, all right, in the past, and so... The reference here is in relation to the great morning that will take place when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. For example, in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, we read about 
how all the tribes of the earth shall mourn. All right, and so in Luke 21, for example, men's hearts will be failing them for fear. All right, because everybody is going to know when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, it's the end of the world. In Revelation chapter 1, it says, Behold, he comes with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall well because of him. Even so, amen. So when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, everybody's going to know it. All right, and all the unsaved are going to wail, and they're going to be mourning, and they're going to be having heart attacks because they know it's the end of this world. All right, and so uh, you can draw the comparison there with uh, you know what we're reading, for example, in, in Revelation 16, and we. Um, you know, we can understand that when we read, uh, you know, um, Zechariah. Where is this at? Did I lose it already? And in Zechariah, when it talks about, I don't know where it's at now. So when it talks about, uh, forgive me, when it talks about m mourning. And they all mourned. I gotta find it because I don't want to butcher it. In that day shall there be a great mourning. Okay, so we can draw a comparison with what we read in Zechariah. All right, so let's go to the thousand years that everybody seems to be talking about and uh, putting their hope into a bonus thousand years that's not found in the Bible at all. I can't show you anywhere in the Bible that talks about a thousand years after the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not anywhere. If we take a look at Revelation 20, we notice here it says, And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Right? In verse 6, But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So it's not Jesus reigning a thousand years. It's his followers reign with him a thousand years. And in fact, in verse 5 it says the rest of the dead live not again until after the thousand years. So just from a logical standpoint, this must be before the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's no way around it. Unless you willfully ignore it. That's And that's what people do. Because they have this worldview that they'll have a thousand years, excuse me, they have a, this worldview of a thousand year bonus after the end of the world, somehow. And then for that thousand years, they'll, they'll get to continue to have sex like they're having today and that's the sole reason for it and but most people aren't honest enough to admit it all right that this whole doctrine of a bonus thousand years is based on lust their desire to have sex their desire to have sexual intercourse and one way you can be nice and ask these people that teach us stuff just be nice about it and ask them, say, hey, will people be having children after Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven? That's one nice way to put it. You might get a response. You might you'd probably get a, uh, you know, uh, unsatisfactory response, but you'll get, you might get a response that way. All right, if you say, uh, you put it more direct like I do, that, hey, do you believe in a thousand years after Jesus comes because you want to continue to have sex? Most people would would not take that very well, right? And um, so, and this is a, just a matter of being honest. If these people were honest, they would say exactly what they think. 
but because they're liars they can't tell the truth because their father is the devil right and there's no truth in them so of course they're not going to tell the truth but that's that's where I would take it if I were to challenge somebody face to face I would ask them do they believe people will be having children after the Lord comes and of course you know how children are made all right so there is no thousand years after the Lord comes and the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished so there's no possible way no possible way that the thousand years is after Jesus comes not possible so let's go to John chapter 11 because I notice uh, a lot of people seem to be confused on this idea of the first resurrection okay here in verse 5 with the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years are finished this is the first resurrection somehow they ignore this part that I got highlighted here but the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished somehow they ignore that and then they just concentrate on first resurrection and they ignore the Lord Jesus Christ and the only reason I can think that people ignore the Lord Jesus Christ is because they hate him okay and so and because they hate him they they have no understanding because they do not believe the Word of God they do not believe the Bible that they hold in their hands okay so let me make this simple for you what is the first resurrection all right, well, Jesus tells us in John 11, he says very directly, very plainly, that he says unto Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? So Jesus is the resurrection. Now you're going to turn around and say, no, he's not the first resurrection. Well, what is he, the second? Res are you the first resurrection? You know, um, no, 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 no. Jesus is the resurrection. We read here in 1 Corinthians 15 how that by death, by I'm sorry, by, uh, by man came death, and by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, oh, I'm sorry, I got that all wrong. For as in, no, 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 maybe I got that right. Hold on a second. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. All right, so every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits. All right, so who's the first resurrection? Was there somebody before Christ? Was it you? If that's what you think, just be honest about it. How can you say that anybody was other than Jesus Christ was the first resurrection? You want to completely ignore the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ? You're in big trouble. Big trouble. All right, because that right there, you're saying you don't follow him. Right? For me, I follow the Lord Jesus Christ. He has led the way for us. He has promised to return for us. He has laid down his life, took it back up, and ascended to heaven with the promise that he will come again and receive us unto himself that where he is there where that's where we may be also I'm butchering that but John 14 Jesus says in my father's house are many mansions if it were not so I would have told you but I go and prepare a place for you and if I go and prepare a place for you I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am 
there ye may be also. All right, so he's going to return for us. All right. And so he has already resurrected and ascended to heaven. And when he returns, we will be lifted up to meet the Lord in the air. All right. In First Thessalonians 4, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the shout of the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. When Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, all the tribes of the earth will mourn because they know it's the end of the world. All right, and this goes back to a prophecy from Genesis 3, verse 15, when the Lord said unto the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now imagine the scenario. The Lord will stomp his foot on the head of the serpent. <clears throat> Excuse me. And putting an end to evil forever. This is speaking of the end of this world. Alright, and then of course in Psalm 110, for example. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou there my right hand. Here, I'm butchering it. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. All right, 1 Corinthians 15, For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. Revelation 3, verse 9, Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. So when Jesus comes, we are lifted up into the air, and our enemy is at our feet. All right, think about this scenario in 2 Peter chapter 3. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away. Here, hold on a second. Where is it at? I skipped it. Missed it. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. So when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, the heavens shall pass away. And the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also. <clears throat> and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Just as God destroyed the world by water in the days of Noah, God will destroy this world by fire in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes in the clouds of heaven. There's no way around it. So you can't have a thousand years. You can't have Jesus returning and then pausing in it midair. Or he's gonna he's gonna stand on the earth for a thousand years and rule with a rod of iron for a thousand years. That's not in the Bible. Uh, I can't show you that because it's not in the Bible. All right. And then what's he gonna do? He's on the earth and then he comes in the clouds of heaven. How's how's that? He's on the earth and then he comes again. How, how does that happen? Nobody wants to talk about it because it doesn't make any sense. All right, so um, I know this is long-winded. Okay, so I'm going to make another really short video after this. So basically, it, to make it real simple, when the Lord Jesus comes, it's the end of the world, and we are changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trump shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together. With them in the clouds. Okay, so in a moment in the twinkling eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Right? First the dead in Christ, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together in the, together in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Right? So when Jesus comes, it's the end of the world and we are changed 
from our corruptible body into our incorruptible body. All right, and then that will mark the, the fulfillment of the saying. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written. Death is swallowed up in victory. There will be no more death after this. All right, that's when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. It's the great day of the Lord, judgment day. All right, and there will be no more tears, no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying. Neither shall there be any more pain. All right, it's the end of this world and the, be the beginning of eternal life with an, a new world, with new heavens and a new earth. And that's what we're putting our hope into. All right, and you think about faith. What is faith? Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Evidence of things not seen. So what are you putting your what are we what are you putting your hope into? All right. What are you putting your hope into? Where are we at? Are you putting your hope into a bonus thousand years where you'll get to rule over ten cities and be able to have sex with all the women that you want? Just be honest. That's what a lot of people are teaching now. Most people are preaching today. They're not being honest about it. But they believe that they will be rewarded ten cities and that they'll have dominion over all the women in those ten cities. All right, it's a bizarre religion, and I'd stay away from those people and challenge them. If if you have a friend who believes that there will be a thousand years after the Lord Jesus comes, just ask. Will you be having children? after the Lord comes. All right, because this is a big deal, right? First of all, in 1 John chapter 2, John tells us uh, very clearly, if we couldn't already figure it out, the world passes away in the lust thereof. There will be no more sex after Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. I mean, even Jesus makes it very clear. That when he comes in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given a marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. This is a nice and easy, simple, family-friendly way of saying there ain't going to be no more dirty, stinky, filthy sex afterwards. All right? What what we got coming for us is a lot better than the filthy, stinky sex. That everybody is so obsessed with nowadays. All right, that's just a nice, friendlier way than the the way I put it. All right, so again, if you believe there's a thousand years after the Lord comes, well, let's talk about this part of it. Will you be having sex? And you want to say, well, no, it's just the unsaved that will be having sex. All right, so the unsaved, according to them, will continue to have sex after the Lord Jesus comes. Well, that's a great way to motivate the unsaved. And, you know, just tell them, hey, don't worry. When Jesus comes, you'll be able to continue to have sex. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. When Jesus comes, it's not the end of the world. So you don't have to believe in him now. Right? You can just wait. You can just wait to believe in him after he comes. Now, isn't that a... Isn't that as wicked as anything that anybody could teach in the world today? 
is to tell the unsaved that they can wait when in reality they can't wait I mean who would tell you that would would God tell the unsaved hey you can wait until after Jesus comes or would the devil be saying that would, wouldn't it be the devil that would say hey you can just wait till after Jesus comes right because when Jesus the reality is when Jesus comes it's judgment day it's the great day of the Lord right and so when this happens then death is swallowed up in victory there is no more death so all the unsaved are done away with forever there is no more opportunity for the unsaved to get saved so that's a that's very deceptive to teach and tell unsaved people that they can wait until the end of the world and they can't all right so um, this world is I think in my opinion far more wicked than what people realize far more wicked consider Luke chapter 21 when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven you know this is parallel with Matthew 24 and Mark 13 where it says the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven this is the same moment in time and in this moment men's hearts will be failing them for fear now why would they be having heart attacks if it's not the end of the world if they're still going to be able to have sex after Jesus comes and carry on their lives like they are now why would they be mourning why would they be wailing and why would they be having heart attacks why would their hearts be failing them for fear well it's pretty obvious it's because they know and we're all gonna know it's the end of the world just as Jesus told us he was asked very plainly there was no uh, ambiguity whatever that word is no you know confusion no mix you know mixing of words or mincing of words they have very direct Jesus was asked very directly what is the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world and this is the end of the world when the sun is darkened and moon not given light and stars shall fall from heaven the powers of the heaven shall be shaken upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity the seas and the waves roaring men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven shall be shaken this is when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven second Peter chapter 3 the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night and an hour which no man knows it's going to be a surprise it's going to be all of a sudden it's going to be without warning it's going to be the end of this world if you, if you don't figure it out by then you'll know at that moment that there will be no more sex ever that's it all right you're not going to be having sex in this moment you're not going to be laughing and giggling when the Lord comes. The joke's going to be over. Alright. And all this teaching, all this nonsense about, well, there's going to be a thousand years where people are going to continue to party hardy and have sex and orgies and all this and that. And there's going to be, what, no more sin? For, there's going to be peace for a thousand years. Peaceful sex and orgies for a thousand years? I mean, if they're having children, then by golly, you know they're having sex. There is, that's, can't get around that. 
And aren't you really just saying that you want to have sex for a thousand years? And you're, these people, they even go so far as to say, well, men will be living for hundreds of years like they did in the Old Testament. And if they're living for hundreds of years like they did in the Old Testament, after Jesus comes and they're having sex for hundreds of years. And isn't that really what it's all about? And I strongly contend that's exactly what it's all about. And the Bible even tells us that's what it going to happen and we see it happening now. Second Peter chapter 3 knowing this first that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust. These people are scoffing the word of God by teaching this stuff that they will be able to have sexual relations for a thousand years after the Lord comes. They're scoffing the Bible. They're making fun of the Bible. And they're making fun of you for believing the Bible. Because they don't believe it. How could you believe it? How could you teach this and still believe the Bible? In Jude. How that they told you excuse me, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lust. They're talking about a thousand years after Jesus comes and they're preaching this doctrine of sex. They, if it's got sex in it, it's a doctrine of sex. Okay? You can call it whatever you want. I know if you speak plainly like I do, you're not going to deceive people. If you tell them, well, no, it's just going to be a thousand years of nice and pe of peace. You know, it's going to be nice. It's going to be peaceful. No sin and a lot of sex. Yeah, that, that's going to attract a lot of people. You're going to attract a lot more people than I will. Guaranteed. But that's not reality, man. You can get a whole world of people on your side. It's not going to change the truth. All right? And whether you, you figure it out now, if you don't figure it out now, you'll know at the end. That when it's the end of the world, it's the end of this world. You know the whole concept of having children... Now, having sex, this stems from what we read in Genesis 3 when Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And because thou hast done this, and unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Notice here in Revelation 21, there shall be no more sorrow. You see that? And this sorrow was brought upon because they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because they done that sorrow was brought, was was uh, given to at you know Adam and Eve. This is specific, uh, specifically to Eve. Right? I will greatly multiply thy sorrow in thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. So this is an indication that, hey, at the end of the world, there is no more sex. Right? All right so at the end of the world, this is done away with. And this... Uh, um, how do I explain this? This uh, uh, plowing of the fields or working. Uh, how do I? How do I say this? Thou shalt eat of the herb of the field. Okay, this sort of. Uh, it's, it's really the the world system. How we function in the world today. It's coming to an end. Right? In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life in sorrow 
So what happens at the end of the world? There's no more sorrow. All right, so we read about this. Uh, I, I could talk about this forever. So what happens is um, in the life to come hereafter, it's eternal life. And we will build and not another man inhabit, right? We will plant it and not another man um, reap. Or we will sow and not another man reap. So everything that we do in the life to come hereafter will be our own. We'll have unlimited creativity without any outside interference. We will not have dominion over another neither will another man have dominion over you it's complete freedom it's gonna be complete freedom we're gonna find out when that time comes whether you figure it out now or not All right, but this whole this whole idea you know <laughs> of a thousand years of sex it, it's to me it's ridiculous it's so ridiculous uh, we consider this here. Let's just play along with their idea that they're going to be able to have peace and sex for a thousand years after Jesus comes. All right, so Jesus comes in their scenario, and there's a thousand years of peace and happiness and sex and orgies. All right, now at the end of the, the thousand years, okay. In their scenario, they're on the earth with their orgies and their sex pots and all that sort of stuff. And then what happens? Fire comes down from God and devours them. Oh, wait a sec. You ever thought about that? I mean, if you're on the earth, and fire comes down from God out of heaven you're in a bad spot Jack no 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 that's not that's not what's gonna happen that's not the truth that's not reality you're gonna find out If you don't figure it out by then you, you'll figure it out you'll see it you'll know it when the time comes that when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven we are lifted up in the air the beloved city where is the I, it's so incredible how people get this wrong let's see uh, let's first of all let's go to Revelation 21 and I saw and John and I saw a new heaven and a new earth the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea and I John saw the holy city New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven think about that New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven and then with the previous verse verse 20 the beloved city the beloved city is New Jerusalem where's that at which in heaven it's above we just read it we just read it you can't figure that out New Jerusalem is above in John 14 Jesus says in my father's house are many mansions if it were not so I would have told you I go and prepare a place for you if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. The beloved city is above. It's above. You can't. We just read that. You can't figure that out? Well, this is not standalone stuff. This is obvious stuff. Here, Jerusalem, which is above, is free. Galatians 4, verse 26. Jerusalem, which is above, is free. Revelation 21, John sees New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, out of heaven. Where is the beloved city? New Jerusalem is the beloved city. It's in heaven. So when the unsaved are gathered together, they are at our feet. Oh, you couldn't figure that out? Maybe that's because you don't believe the Bible. Revelation 3, Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. We're up in the air. Our enemy is gathered at our feet. Right? Consider Matthew 13. 
Matthew 13, the parable of the wheat and the tares. The tares are put in bundles, right? The tares are put in bundles to be burned. What about the wheat? Where's the wheat? Where did the, where's the wheat gathered? Right next to the bundle of uh, tares? No, in my barn. But gather the wheat into my barn. That barn is in the new, the new city, the holy city, New Jerusalem. All right, the harvest is the end of the world. That's when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. It's the end of the world. We just read about that in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. It's the end of the world. What happens? Men's hearts will be failing them for fear. Right? Revelation chapter 1. All the tribes of the earth will... Well, they will be wailing because of him. All kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, because they know it's the end of this world. All right. So you see why it's so hard for me to make a condensed version. I'm going to try this again to make it like 30 seconds long. All right. I'm going to try to. This is going to be the long version, and then I'm going to make a short version. It's impossible for me to drink this much coffee and to say very little. All right, so I I drink two cups every morning, and after I, you know, once I get on the second cup, watch out. All right. So, anyways, I I don't know if anybody even watches, but if uh, if you have any, if you're still watching, and you have um, you know questions or anything at all please let me know because I enjoy talking about this it's astonishing to me that it seems like 99.9% .9 I'm having a hard time I can't find anybody quite frankly who's teaching this stuff right they all got it wrong there is no millennial kingdom and there it doesn't exist it, it's not there in the Bible I can I showed it to you it's as plain as day. There is no thousand years after the Lord comes. This is talking about us reigning with Christ. It doesn't say Jesus reigns a thousand years. Are you blind or something? Or just stupid? Because it does not say at all that Jesus reigns a thousand years. I even got one comment here. Check this out. Check this out. Oh, maybe I... I don't have it here. Maybe this is it right here. Check this out. In what way is this not saying a thousand year reign of Christ? And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. How do you... And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Where are you reading a thousand year reign of Christ? It's not there. It's talking about us. <laughs> How, how can you not figure that out? We that are born of God, we that are saved, we that are priests of God and of Christ, we live and reign with Christ for a thousand years. Doesn't say anything at all about Christ reigning for a thousand years. And we, we know that it would be impossible for Christ to reign a thousand years. What, what are you saying? He's going to reign for a thousand years and then that's it? It's over? Fire is going to come down from heaven and kill God? Or kill uh, Jesus? I mean, what are you teaching exactly? Why don't you talk about it? Right, we know Jesus reigns forever. Is this a lie? Should I get my magic marker and blot that out? Or maybe God's going to blot you out. You ever thought about that? I mean, really? Maybe God, God's going to blot you out if, for getting this wrong. If any man shall take away from the words of this book, of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city. Where is that holy city? It's above, isn't it? You're going to put it down on the earth? And teach that that fire is going to come down from God and devour the holy city, God. You got Jesus Christ on the earth, and then fire is going to come down and devour him. 
Is that what you got? Alright. I think about that. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Are you sure that you want to get this wrong? All right. Are you sure that when this happens, are you sure that Jesus is going to come in the clouds of heaven and there's going to be a thousand years? Are you sure about that? It's a pretty big deal. Are you sure that Jesus is going to reign and rule on earth for a thousand years and then fire is going to come down from God? Wait a second. I thought God was on the earth. Well, maybe Jesus isn't God in your eyes. Maybe Jesus in your eyes is the devil. Maybe you're on the wrong side of the fence. And you're just preaching things as you see it. And so in your mind, you're being truthful. But in reality, you're on the wrong side, partner. You're on the wrong side.